On this Sunday night, resisting Russia. Battles rage throughout Ukraine. I believe that people will fight till the last drop of blood. No matter we will die or we will win, but we will win. The mass exodus from the country as the two sides agree to talk. Turning up the pressure on Vladimir Putin. This is a watershed moment. Tightening sanctions and unprecedented measures aimed at ending the invasion. Also tonight, separated by war. It can happen with you in every home in Europe. Families forced apart and facing an uncertain future. And live from New York, a powerful tribute to Ukraine. Global National, reporting tonight, Sophie Louis. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There are significant developments out of Ukraine and Russia tonight. After another day of intense fighting, both sides have agreed to their first talks since the invasion began. The Ukrainian government says the talks will happen Monday morning at the Ukraine-Belarus border. Even so, Vladimir Putin has put his nuclear forces on high alert, blaming what he calls aggressive statements made by NATO powers. And his forces are pushing forward around Ukraine's capital. New satellite images show a long convoy of Russian forces and vehicles rolling toward Kyiv. Ukraine's foreign minister vowing Ukraine will keep up its resistance. The goal of Russia is to destroy Ukraine as a state, is to destroy Ukrainians as a nation. But we will not fall. We will not stop or get tired. This is people's war. Today, Canada promised an additional $25 million worth of non-lethal military protective equipment to Ukraine. Though Canada and its NATO allies have bolstered forces in Eastern Europe, Defence Minister Anita Anand says they won't be sent into battle in Ukraine. A combat mission is not on the table at this time, nor is it on the table for our allies, including the United States. And all of this while the assault on Ukraine continues and the exodus to neighboring countries grows. Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gomancing is in Poland near the Ukrainian border. Crystal, you visited a number of crossing points. What did you see today? Sophie, the Medica crossing is where cameraman Braden and I crossed just six days ago. You can cross on foot or go by vehicle. Now there is a steady stream of people coming across with suitcases or hauling bags. Some are crying. Others are just sitting there with a blank stare on their face, which honestly is a little more haunting because it makes you wonder what they've seen. Across Ukraine, the marks of war are everywhere. In its second largest city, Russian forces have been relentless in their attempts to overtake Kharkiv. The days-long battles punishing. On Sunday, Russia's president moved his war closer to the edge, ordering a nuclear alert directive, putting Russia's nuclear arsenal in an increased state of readiness is a dramatic escalation. That raises concerns. The crisis, already a full-on assault, could next lead to nuclear warfare, whether by design or mistake. It's a video with the bombing of my house. This man so left Kyiv before now. the bombing started there. Now he says he has no choice but to move his 11-year-old daughter to Poland. I choose her safety, and that's it. And this is very difficult for me. It's hard to see a clear path to peace, but that remains the stated wish of Ukraine's president. Vladimir Zelensky has agreed to meet with Russia in Belarus after talks with its pro-Russian leader. But Ukraine will concede nothing. Zelensky says he agreed to the meeting to show his people he's dedicated to ending the war. This is all my life here. It's all what I have with me. Polish officials now say 200,000 Ukrainians have crossed over its border. Nearly every face either streaked with tears or almost blank, expressionless, a sign of the shock so many are living. People arrive continuously on foot, in cars, 
and on buses. There is a lot of work being done to organize donations. You see piles of clothes, but also food, transportation. But it is a bit of a chaotic situation. People are wandering around, not quite sure where to go, asking for help. Be a group of 10 people, my children and my sister's children. In the sea of people arriving, one stood out, walking towards Ukraine. After escorting four grandchildren to safety, this woman is heading home. Uh, yes, I, I have my work there, and uh, uh, I have my house there, my home. That pull to go home, to be in Ukraine, is just so strong. But for the majority of people, it's just not safe. Sophie? Our Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gomensing in Poland tonight. Crystal, thank you. Ukrainian forces are continuing to hold their capital from the Russians, but there is word tonight the city is surrounded. Associated Press reporter Joe Fetterman has been in Kyiv since the fighting began and joins us now. Joe, thanks for joining us once again. It's, uh, it seems very quiet in Kyiv right at this moment, but things seem to change uh, at, at any moment. The situation can change there. What's going on now? Yes, uh, I'm in the heart of Kyiv, central, uh, central part of the city near the main square, and it is uh, not only quiet, it is eerily quiet. I mean, it is so quiet that uh, a neighboring building uh, has wind chimes that I can hear tingling and jingling uh, when there's a breeze here in the heart of a, a normally a very busy street. Um, uh, so nobody is out on the streets right now. We're uh, under curfew, and anybody who goes out is considered a suspect and risks uh, being shot. So um, that said, the quiet does not always last. Um, we're in a lull. We've seen many of these uh, lulls, and they usually uh, they may last an hour or two, but they're frequently interrupted by air raid sirens. Last night there was gunfire behind us. So the heavy fighting has not reached the heart of Kiev, but it's certainly on the outskirts of town, and the fears are that it's getting closer and closer. And in fact, what we're hearing from the mayor of Kyiv, he's told the Associated Press that the city is encircled. Uh, what is that doing to the, the mood of people in Kyiv, the, the threat of Russians getting closer, and the concern about supply shortages in the days to come if the situation doesn't change? Yeah, the mayor gave us a, a mixed message. On one hand, spirits remain high. I think people are encouraged by uh, the leader, the President Zelensky, uh, standing up for his people, remaining defiant. I think they're encouraged by signs that the uh, Ukrainian military is performing well and inflicting heavy damage on the invading Russian forces. But at the same time, he says the city is surrounded. He says it's too dangerous for people uh, to leave right now. And he's worried. He says things are hanging on for the time being, but he's worried about food supplies, he's worried about medicine, and he's worried about the city eventually being strangled by the Russian forces. Now, Joe, talks are scheduled for tomorrow between the two sides. What's the reaction from people in Kyiv to that news? Is it optimism or is it skepticism? I would say it is cautious optimism at best. People have been through a lot. They, there's a lot of mistrust uh, toward the Russians, and uh, President Putin has been very unpredictable throughout this whole thing. So there are a lot of question marks surrounding uh, these talks, uh, starting with what are Russia's motives? Are they serious about these talks, or is this something just, uh, just to buy time? Uh, we don't even know when these talks are going to begin. We don't know what the agenda is going to be. Is it going to be just a short-term ceasefire, or is it uh, more substantial talks? talking about the issues that led us to this point. Who's going to represent the sides? Are they going to be senior decision makers or just low-level diplomats? So there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of question marks here. That said, anytime you get the two sides together, any time that they're talking to each other, that gives you at least something to latch on to uh, for hoping to resolve this crisis. We'll see if anything comes of those talks. All right, thanks for joining us once again. Associated Press reporter Joe Fetterman in Kyiv. Well, the head of the European Commission says Ukraine is, quote, one of us, and we want them in the European Union. The EU adding more sanctions today, closing its airspace to Russian planes and taking the unprecedented step of financing weapons for Ukraine. Redmond Shannon reports. An ovation for Ukraine's ambassador at the Reichstag after Germany's historic decision to send weapons to Ukraine, reversing a post-Second World War pacifist policy. 
Der Krieg ist eine Katastrophe für die Ukraine. Chancellor Olaf Scholz also adding new funding for Germany's military and a similarly historic move from the heart of power in Europe too. For the first time ever, the European Union will finance the purchase and delivery of weapons and other equipment to a country that is under attack. This is a watershed moment. After financial sanctions with Canada and others, the EU adding more measures targeting Russia. Our airspace will be closed to every Russian plane, and that includes the private jets of oligarchs too. Russian airline Aeroflot forced to cancel all flights to European destinations. I mean, it's just a total sea change that happened over a 48-hour period. It's remarkable. Bill Browder has campaigned for a decade for sanctions against Vladimir Putin and his closest allies. The, the oligarchs hold their money, and so we have to go after the top Russian oligarchs. Other new measures include EU sanctions against Russia's ally, the Lukashenko regime in Belarus, a wider ban on Russia's central bank from accessing its foreign reserves and kicking many Russian banks out of the SWIFT international bank payment system. Full details on that are still to be decided, but some Russian banks will be exempt, likely to allow Europe to buy Russian oil and gas. So there are questions to be asked here and ways to extend the reach of these sanctions in the days to come. Analyst Josh Lipsky believes the block on foreign reserves could cause a shortage of cash or even a run on Russian banks. Plus inflation, plus food prices going up within Russia, plus supply chain shortages now. So all of those things together put enormous pressure on the Russian economy. In the Vatican, prayers for peace rather than sanctions. Pope Francis calling on more governments to open up humanitarian corridors for refugees. Sanctions against Russia are not just coming from world governments. Oil giant BP says it's selling off its stake in a Russian oil company. And FIFA, the international soccer body, says Russia's national teams cannot play using their flag or anthem. That is, if any country agrees to play against them. Sophie? Redmond Shannon in London. Redmond, thank you. The sanctions Canada and its allies have imposed on Russia have yet to deter the attacks on Ukraine. So will Canada take things a step further and ban the importation of one of Russia's biggest exports, oil and gas? Mercedes Stevenson put that question to Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie on this weekend's edition of the West Bloc. Is Canada prepared to ban the importation of Russian oil and gas to Canada because we do import some now? Are you ready to cut that off and say, no, we already have oil and gas in Canada. We're going to find a way to use that. We're ready to do many things, Mercedes. Going back to your last question, it is important for us to play a role, including in our ports, including on, in our airspace, including when it comes to our imports. But when we will do so, we'll do that at the same time as our allies. Because first and foremost, that's the best way to have a lot of impact at the same time. Second, we don't want to create a loophole. Canada won't be the loophole in this entire strategy. So that's why I've been in contact with my colleagues from the G7. I spoke to Secretary Blinken on Friday with my colleague from Germany um, on Thursday. And that's why also I'm having this conversation and this meeting with the G7. It is very, very important that people watching us right now know that the best way to be really imposing a lot of pressure on President Putin right now is by, by being united, and we are. It doesn't seem like the sanctions have in any way slowed down or stopped Vladimir Putin, though. So what else do you need to consider? Well, I've mentioned you many, many things. Uh, and like I, I just said, everything is on the table. I think we can be extremely proud of uh, Ukrainians right now, which are fighting for their lives and that uh, uh, are in a very dire situation. Ahead, how the Russian invasion is prompting renewed calls to build the controversial Keystone XL pipeline. Crowds gathered across Canada today, including in downtown Toronto, for a mega march to support Ukraine and to condemn Russia's invasion of that country. The crowd gathering at Young and Dundas, Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland, 
in attendance in the sea of protesters. Well, with the Russian invasion, there are renewed calls for the U.S. to restart construction of the Keystone XL pipeline. Speaking on ABC's This Week, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki gave no indication the U.S. would reverse that decision anytime soon. I would say that the congressman's recommendations there, the Keystone Pipeline, was not processing oil through the system. That does not solve any problems. That's a misdiagnosis or maybe a, a, a misdiagnosis of what needs to happen. I would also note that on oil leases, what this actually justifies in President Biden's view is the fact that we need to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, on oil in general, and, need to, and we need to look at other ways of, process, of having energy in our country and others. TC Energy pulled the plug on the Keystone XL pipeline after U.S. President Joe Biden revoked its permit in 2021. Well, the U.S. is sending millions of dollars in military and humanitarian aid to help Ukraine and its people. But President Biden maintains he will not send American troops into this war. Jennifer Johnson reports. While U.S. soldiers remain outside Ukraine ready to defend NATO allies, more American military equipment is coming in. The U.S. has pledged another $400 million in military and humanitarian aid to help Ukraine fight for its survival. We are grateful for everything that is there already and that is about to come, and we need more because we are defending the, our country against a very strong enemy. U.S. President Joe Biden has asked Congress for an additional $6 billion for Ukraine, most for its military. The White House is dismissing Russian President Vladimir Putin's threat that he has put his nuclear forces on alert as the West continues to aid Ukraine. This is really a pattern that we've seen from President Putin through the course of this conflict, which is uh, manufacturing threats that don't exist in order to justify further aggression. President Biden is re-emphasizing that American troops cannot enter this war without creating further historic escalation. You have two options. Start a third world war, go to war with Russia physically, or two, um, make sure that uh, a country that acts so contrary to international law ends up paying a price for having done it. Along with severe economic sanctions from the U.S., Canada, and the European Union, big business is beginning to act. Google is now blocking Russia from monetizing state media on its platforms, including apps and YouTube. And a handful of airlines will no longer fly into Russia, Delta suspending its partnership with Russia's Aeroflot. While others are protesting in a different way, dumping Russian vodka from bars and restaurants, like in Canada. Evil Pie is going to be offering $5 F Putin shots of Ukrainian vodka, and all proceeds are going to go to support humanitarian efforts in Ukraine. More and more businesses and individuals aiming to hit Russia where it hurts in protests of this unprovoked war. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Global National will be back in a moment. Russian riot police are cracking down as anti-war protests spread across the country. More than 2,000 people were arrested today at demonstrations held in 48 Russian cities. In St. Petersburg, riot police carried away protesters standing arm in arm in the frigid temperatures. And in Moscow, demonstrators hit the streets with anti-war signs before many of them were detained and taken into custody. Well, after serving as a launch pad for Russia's assault on Ukraine, Belarus is holding a referendum on amendments to its constitution that would allow nuclear weapons on its soil. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko cast his ballot today in a vote that's almost certain to pass under his autocratic regime. The country has been a nuclear-free zone since 1994. Oh. Next, SNL breaks with tradition in tribute to Ukraine. One of the sad realities of war is that innocents get caught in the crossfire. For Ukraine, it is more complicated because all men between the ages of 18 and 60 are prevented from leaving so that they can join the fight. That's led to tough choices that no family wants to make. Mike Trillet reports. The layers to this reunion between mother and son are as complex as they are cruel. To hug his mother again, this Ukrainian boy had to say goodbye to his father, who was forced to stay back to fight. 
and have faith that a total stranger would deliver he and his sister across the border safely. That's the stranger, the boy said, pointing to the woman in yellow. And they cried. One mother for the joy of seeing her kids again, the other for what she may still lose, the two adult children she left behind in Ukraine. There is too much agony on Ukraine's border to process. It's tragedy on constant repeat. Little children still clutching the trappings of the happy, normal lives they lived only days ago, now confronted with miles to walk along a muddy border and an uncertain future. My father is military, so he's in Kiev, he's defending Kiev. If they haven't already paid a price for their freedom, they know it could still come down the road. My message will be very short that it can happen with you in every home in Europe because nobody knows what he uh, what Putin wants and where he will finish. It's that sentiment that's drawn Oleg Hurt to this same border crossing. A Ukrainian who now lives in Germany, he didn't have to return to his homeland, but his mother, sister and extended family are still there. The Russians, he says, must go. But oh, the sacrifice he's making. I've left my wife and three children behind, he says, but I'm going because I can't live with it. That's war, an endless series of awful choices where no one ever wins. Least of all the children who are seeing their families torn apart for reasons few can explain. Microlight Global News. And that is Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Sophie Louie. We leave you tonight with a tribute to the people of Ukraine. This is the Ukrainian chorus Domka of New York performing on Saturday Night Live with the song A Prayer for Ukraine. Thanks for watching and have a good night.